Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our November meetup that you not only will get real about UX. I'm Tina Evel, and I'll be your host today. And again, we are very happy to see people joining again today, even though we know that people are starting to get a bit of a Zoom fatigue, and it's like in the in Danish we call Ulvetim here in Denmark. But I hope that you've had a lovely day so far, and I also hope that you've had a lovely day or a lovely morning, I guess, Joe, where you are at. So far, so good. So, the sun is shining here, actually. Oh, okay. We're a bit envious then, to be honest. I'm sorry. So, yeah. So Joe is a UX consultant, author and speaker, and uh, for the past uh, 30 years, she has helped project teams of all kinds improve UX, uh, product UX, and integrate UX best practices without changing their current processes. And if you're interested in knowing more about Joe's courses, books, articles, and free UX resources, I definitely recommend you going to his homepage, givegoodux.com. So the agenda for today is that when I'm done with all these practicalities, Joe will start his talk. As always, you can ask questions in the QA section here in Zoom, and we'll go through them at the end of the session. We are recording everything, and we'll share recording of the talk during the next week or so, and we will also share Joe's slides. And for those of you who do not know Preely yet, Preely is a self-service platform for unmoderated remote user testing, and you can actually also host your own user panel on our platform. So if that's something that sounds very intriguing to you, I definitely recommend you to reach out to us, and then we'll see if we can do some magic together. I think that was it for me, Joe. Take away. Excellent. All right. So before I share my screen, um, I just want to say a, a couple things. And that is, if there's one thing that I know, okay, across the last three decades of my career, it's that, unfortunately, a lot of what we've all been taught and trained, and even the things that we're exposed to every day on the internet about what constitutes UX practice and process, okay, best practices, whatever, a lot of this stuff is great on paper. A lot of it fails miserably when the rubber hits the road. And I have no doubt that some of you, at least, if not many of you, are feeling that frustration on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? The way it's supposed to be and the way it is are two very different things. I think we all know that. The reason that happens is something that, unfortunately, I, I don't think as a profession we talk about very much. So part of my goal today is to kind of give you a dose of reality. And some of that may land in a way that makes you a little uncomfortable. I encourage you to stay with it anyway. Because the things that you face every day, okay, the, the percentage of things that you're gonna face every day, every week, and throughout your career, only a certain percentage of them are actually changeable, okay? But there are things that can be done. And a lot of it hinges on how you go about doing your job, how you speak, how you act, the things that you talk to stakeholders about, things you talk to clients about. Okay. So that's a lot of what I'm going to go over today. I'm going to um, hope that's going to be helpful. I will try to be clear and concise, although I talk too much and uh, we'll take questions at the end. So with that, I am going to share my screen. And I'm also going to hide this. Well, I'm going to attempt to. There we go. Okay, everybody should see a slide that says getting real about UX. We I'm do. That's right. Okay. Full screen. Here we go. How many of you out there work in an environment where the urgent trumps the important? Right, you know what you know what the, the things that are most worth doing are. However, every five minutes there's something that sort of supersedes that. Someone says, "We need this. We need this. Can you do this? Can you do this by, you know, yesterday ASAP?" Is it a situation where speed and task completion matter more than value or success? How many of you are working to convince your bosses or your fellow employees? to add UX practices and processes. Any of you out there fighting <laughs> with stakeholders or with clients or with developers uh, or with product owners or product managers or project managers for that matter, um, just to do the job right. I meet people every week who feel like they are fighting to be allowed to do their job. This is much more widespread and much more normal than I think anybody admits. 
Is that working? Are those battles working? Are you winning? Are you getting what you need? Are you convincing folks? Or does it feel like a treadmill? How many of you are quote unquote integrated into an agile product development approach? Integrated is in quotes there because that rarely happens. Is it working? Is, is, is working inside an agile or lean or safe or whatever process you happen to be using, is that going the way that everybody you think it should? Is it frictionless? Is there true collaboration or is there combat? Are there surprises? How many of you feel like this? I'd be willing to bet that a lot of you feel like this. And here's what I hear all the time every week. All right, I, I, from students, I've got over 280,000 students who've taken my courses. Uh, I work with clients just about every month, client teams. I coach people individually, and this is what I hear. They don't get it. I hear this over and over and over again every day of every week. They just don't get it. Now, it's true that organizations misunderstand what UX work really is, what design work really is, right? That it's more than making things look pretty. However, so do far too many UXers, designers, and developers. UX, to my definition, is just Joe's definition, okay, and has been for a very long time. To me, user experience, UX work of any kind, the value of what we do is enabling what I call a value loop. There's a product in the center. It's an app, it's a site, it's a system. On one hand, we have a user on one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, we have a business, an organization who is sponsoring, funding, deciding to build or improve this product. Here's what has to happen. First of all, a user has to perceive that there's value in this product, right? They have to get a sense of, huh, I think that could help me do A, B, C, or D. And if they perceive that there's value, they'll act on it. They'll use it. They'll try it. They'll download it. Um, they'll buy it. Even in the case of mandated use, okay, if, they're, if you're working in-house and you have no choice but to use a system, you'd be surprised how many people sit on their hands and won't use what's in front of them because it sucks, because it's terrible. So they have to perceive that there's value in order to actually use the thing. When that use occurs, ideally what happens is that value comes back to that user. Oh, okay. That was good. That was, that was nice. That helped me. That made me faster, better, more efficient, okay, more useful in some way. If that happens, hopefully what also occurs is that value comes back to that organization, usually in the form of money, <laughs> right? It's money made or money saved most days. If that occurs, the organization now perceives value in the product. Okay, this is worth improving. This is worth doing better, right? Improving the user experience, improving, improving the user interface design, whatever it is. Here's why I point this out to you. This is the part that we forget about. UX folks talk so much incessantly almost about users. Users, users, users. Users, everything is user-centered, user-focused, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here's the truth. If the business doesn't have a good reason to care about UX improvement, they won't, okay? Businesses, organizations, for the most part, only care about UX insofar as it gets them what they already want. That is a premise that I want you to carry with you throughout this entire talk. I want to get three things out of the way up front before I get into the meat of the matter here. The first is that clients and stakeholders, despite what you may think, are not your enemies. They're only adversarial and will only be adversarial if you allow them to be, and I will illuminate that in a little bit. Number two, most developers and engineers do care about UX. I've been working with development teams for the majority of my career, okay, probably 25 years at this point. I have yet to meet a development team, meaning pure developers, programmers, even back-end database folks who didn't care about the end result, who didn't care about how easily people could actually use what they're building. In fact, they care a great deal. The dynamic of the relationship between designers and developers, between UXers and developers, between developers and the rest of the organization is such that that is almost never surfaced, but it is very true, I promise you. And finally, your hands are not as tied as you think. And I'm going to speak to that as well. Does this look familiar to anybody? This is Sisyphus, condemned to roll this rock up the hill for eternity, only to have it come back down on him each time he does. There are a lot of folks I talk to every week 
who feel like this is their reality. They push the rock up the hill. They fight, they fight, they fight. They get a little ground and then something happens. And now we're back where we started. And we've got all these other problems because people won't listen to us. So I hear things like talking about stakeholders, talking about clients, talking about business people, product owners. They don't care. They don't understand. They won't listen to me. And here's my favorite one. They won't let me, which I am here to tell you, there is no such thing as they won't let me. None. There are many situations in which it is much better to ask forgiveness instead of permission. If you ask permission in a lot of cases to do UX work, you are also asking to be told no. I can't tell you how many teams I've talked to that said, well, we want to do this research, right? And I say, well, do you have access to users? And they say, well, yeah. I said, so what's stopping you from doing it? They said, well, it's not, it's not included in our project sprint. And I say, okay, can you carve out three hours this week? To make that happen? Do you have three hours somewhere where you can make that a reality? They say, yeah. And I say, do it. You don't have to tell anybody about it. Just do it. Okay. Do it. Use it to improve the work. And when the work is improved after the fact, which it will be undoubtedly, people may get a little bent out of shape that, well, I, you know, I thought we weren't going to do this. But when they see the results, it won't matter. I've been down that road more times than I can count in the last several decades. Throughout this talk, I'm going to give you what I consider to be UX truths. And here's the first one. It's not them. It's you. Let that sink in for a minute. It'll make sense later. This is my, my, one of my favorite things. I love this, this image. This is the cliched UXer or designer. He's got his cool mustache and his cool glasses and his suspenders and his tie. And he's like, yeah, we're going to make things happen. I just, it just makes me laugh. UX and design sort of have cults attached to them, and they all have a common refrain when it comes to those they work with and the people they work for. And that is, we need to educate them. I've been hearing this my entire career. Okay, we need to educate them. We need to teach them the value of good UX and the good and good design, right? They need to be educated. Here's the thing. No, you don't. You don't need to educate anybody. Nobody wants to be educated. Nobody's asking to be educated. Okay. Here's what happens. When you put yourself in a position and say, I am going to educate somebody, you're essentially wearing this badge. Now imagine if you walked into a room wearing this badge, imagine the reaction of people. Okay, but that's how it comes across. When you take it upon yourself to educate somebody, you are putting yourself on a pedestal. We're up here, you're down there because you don't get it. I promise you, no matter how self-righteous that feels in the moment, and I've been there too, okay? Please don't get me wrong about this. I, I am routinely often as frustrated with clients as you are. But you cannot approach it in this way. You cannot approach it from the perspective of, I'm going to educate you. There is nothing good that comes from that, no matter how well-intentioned you are, no matter how diplomatically you put these things across. The other person is sitting there feeling like, why are you lecturing me? What really happens, or really should happen, I should say, is you need to communicate with them, okay? This isn't about lecturing. It's not about educating. It's about open, honest, transparent communication. Our problem as a profession are the things we use to do that, okay? And the things that are, that are routinely talked about that we should use to do that. For example, we use diagrams like this to explain what we do, or this, or this, or this, user journey, okay, or this, or here's my favorite one, customer experience map. Now take a good look at the complexity there. I want you to think about your own experience for a second in the company you work for or clients you've worked for if you work for yourself. And I want you to really honestly tell me how many of those folks were willing to look at something this detailed and really fully read and absorb and pay attention to and internalize every single thing here. You know the answer to that question as well as I do. Okay, we got to stop this. As a profession, we have to stop this. These deliverables are ridiculous. The purpose of these diagrams is not to communicate because it doesn't happen. All right, it's to impress in a lot of cases, if we're honest with ourselves. It's to convince other people that we know what we're doing. Right? It's a bid for legitimacy. 
It's I am just as valid as these developers you pay, as these researchers, as these um, salespeople, okay? Just as marketing, operations, whatever. The problem is that the visual complexity of, of these things is intimidating for many people. You may not think so, but it's absolutely true. Okay, I've had enough back channel conversations with executives and product owners and managers to know that in a lot of cases, they're tuning you out and ignoring what you're saying. Or worse, nine times out of 10, they pretend they get it. People sit there and nod their heads while you're talking, while you're working, going through all this stuff in a deliverable like that. And they agree to things that they don't really understand. And they walk out of the room and folks on our side of the fence think, okay, that was great. Everybody got it. Everybody understood it. They're all on the same page. I'm telling you, I have conversations with these same product owners, these same product managers, the same executives who have said to me at one point or another that repeatedly over the last 20 years, I'm going to be straight with you. I don't understand what we're doing here or why we're doing it or what it gets us. That's because you're essentially presenting them in a foreign language. It doesn't make sense to them. Okay. What about the terminology we use as a profession? Okay. What about these things? What about these words? I mean, some of these things, when I read them, I, I hear this sort of ridiculous, like Monty Python-esque uh, accent, like prioritization matrices, multivariate testing, usability testing, machine ethnography, confidence intervals. Okay, <laughs> I'm being ridiculous on purpose because I find that funny. But the terminology we use doesn't mean anything to anybody. There's no magic in these words. There's no magic in using the vocabulary that we routinely use in front of people who have no idea what the fuck we're talking about, okay? <laughs> Those words don't mean anything to anybody but you. They don't. We want to think that they do, but they don't. Using those terms does not make anyone any more legitimate, I promise you, okay? I know all those big words. I don't ever use them with clients, ever. In fact, I don't even say the word UX if I can get away with it, okay? Never, never. Why? Because I don't want to introduce anything that gives them a moment of pause where they're like, okay, what does he mean by that? Because the minute that happens, I've lost them. And if they're struggling in their heads to go, okay, what, is it, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? They're not paying attention to me at that point forward, okay? They are tuning me out and everything else I say is going to be irrelevant because they're still stuck on that thing. Like, what the hell does that mean? And they're too embarrassed to say out loud that they don't know what I'm talking about. So again, people will sit in meetings with you and they will agree to everything you say. And the truth is in a lot of cases, they don't know what you're talking about. People need to hear what you have to say. All right. You have a valuable point of view to express. There's no question about that. The value of the work you do is not under debate here. Okay. But when you talk about it, you have to say it in a way that ensures people will understand you. Okay. So your truth number two is you must speak the language of the people you're talking to clearly, simply, plainly. I always talk to people in a way that assumes they have no idea what I'm talking about. All right. That, that's always been my thing. It's the way I teach. It's the way I consult with clients. Um, and these are sophisticated clients. Okay. These are Fortune 100 organizations, government agencies, big global organizations. I talk to them the way I'm talking to you right now. The questions I'm asked most often about tend to be about UX tools. Okay. If people on online, on social media, my students, um, people on teams I consult with, everyone wants to know about tools. What tool should I use for this? Or what software should I use for this? Meaning, you know, methodologies, processes, software, et cetera. If you go to Google right now and type in UX best practices or UX just about anything, you're going to get search results that are all about tools, 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 tools. We are obsessed <laughs> with, with tools, with methodology, with process, okay? Deliverables, process, Go to General Assembly right now, affinity mapping, card sorting, customer journey mapping, right? These are all processes. This is my friend, Sonder. He is, I consider him to be my brother from another mother. He is, um, he's one of the coolest humans I've ever met in my entire life. And what made us friends is something he said at a conference we were both speaking at. Um, I was checking out his talk and he said, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And I wrote it down. I'm like, I, I love this guy right now. <laughs> And it turns out we have an awful lot in common. Um, 
and truly enjoy each other's company. So I use this because it's illustrative of the next thing I want to say, which is tools are useful. Okay, don't get me wrong. In many cases, they're necessary. We all know that. But they will not solve most root causes of UX issues. You cannot lean on a tool or a process or a formal anything by the book in order to magically figure out what's going on. It doesn't work that way. So too often, these things that we, that we talk so much about become a crutch. You may have heard this quote before. It's Emmanuel Strauss. A bad craftsman blames his tools. I want to change it slightly. To say a bad craftsman is a slave to his tools. To me, if you can't do it using a whiteboard marker and a whiteboard or a pen and a piece of paper or a conversation, if you absolutely have to have software to solve problems, you have bigger issues. All right, so craftsmen, who, who are craftsmen? They're, they're us, they're UXers, they're designers, they're developers, they're product owners. Tools, lean methodologies, agile methodologies, safe now is, is a thing, which is basically like waterfall all over again. Um, frameworks that we use, right? We're very big on frameworks and design libraries and patterns, uh, software, best practices, quote unquote, all right? We quote all these things relentlessly as if they are somehow magic bullets that make our work easier. And the truth is they're not enough. They're good, they're helpful, they're useful. Please don't misunderstand me. They're good, but they're not enough and they are not the things that move the needle. Corporate reality is extremely very, very, very messy. People and politics account for an awful lot of the obstacles that you deal with on a daily basis. Okay, human messiness. We are, we are messy people. <laughs> We're emotional. Okay, the kind of morning we had may dictate the conversation that we have with somebody and how that goes and what we'll agree to and what we won't, you know. So the way it's supposed to be done, quote unquote, will get you nowhere fast. You cannot adhere to these rules and say, well, it should be like this. You got to deal with what is. That is my mantra and has been my mantra for the last 30 years of my life. I'm not interested in what should be. I'm interested in what is. What's the situation right now and how do we deal with it? I'm not going to waste a single second complaining about well, what should happen is I don't care. Okay, let's get something valuable done here. How can you follow a UX process that looks like this? Perfectly well, clean, ordered. I mean, look how beautiful that is, right? Makes all the sense in the world. We look across this, we go, ah, oh, yeah, exactly. That's how it should be done. The problem is that you can't follow something that looks like this because corporate reality looks like this. It's a mess. This is something I do with every client, okay? Especially with stakeholders at the beginning. I want, I want uh, representatives from every single department in the very first kickoff meeting. And what I do is I make them walk me through what happens, either what happens with, with customers using a product or what happens like if this is an internal uh, piece of software, what happens when people start using it? So I start with black, black marker only. We call this the happy path. And I ask somebody to walk me through what happens, boxes and arrows. Well, first this team kickoff meeting happens. Then we have a content kickoff meeting. Then we get an agenda. And then there's a faculty invitation vetting process, right? So it's nice and clean. And then sooner or later, you start to see people shifting in their seats and making faces and getting uncomfortable. Uh, so I call that out. I say, okay, you're making a face over there. What's, what's that about? And they'll go, well... The thing is, that's the way it's supposed to happen. But what really occurs is that at that faculty invitation vetting process, there's an outside person who's a collaborator that may or may not be involved, but should be involved. And then there's, they have to pull in additional faculty. And then there's a timeline issue because we have to deal with grant developers and uh, commercial supporters. And there's a checklist that has to be. And so they're saying there's all this shit that happens and we're waiting, we're sitting. So I highlight all that in orange. Already we've got a deviation. And as we go, and as I do this, you can see that there's a bunch of blue. See all the additional heads <laughs> in there and blue circles and roundabout arrows and see how ridiculous this starts to get and unordered this starts to get. That's from people piping up during that process and saying, yeah, but what actually happens is these people have to get involved. And then it goes through this process. Here's the reason I do this. I want everybody in the room to see just how messed up, dysfunctional, and overly complex and redundant in some cases, their process is. Because in their heads, it works beautifully. It's this nice ordered process from step one to step 25. And it isn't. It's this. It's always this, folks. I promise you. 
I have yet to see it differently in any company I've ever worked with. It's chaos all the time. Okay, so you have to deal with this. You can't deal with that perfectly ordered process. It doesn't mean anything. So, unpopular opinion. I am of the frame of mind that, that too many of those complex formal UX methods you hear about, all those diagrams that we share so often on social media, they're just ego-driven fantasies, okay? About meant to show us how smart their authors are. Well, the process I use is this. When I see those things, I, I'm just telling you, I, I've been doing this too long. And I think to myself, eh, that doesn't work. You know, that doesn't work. I know that doesn't work. Sorry. I'm, and I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I've been around too long. I've been doing this too long. How many of you propose significant user research work at the outset of a project? I'm willing to bet a significant number of you. Does it get approved? Does it get done? Does it happen? How many of you create personas, for example, to help everyone understand user needs? Does anyone else actively use those things after they're created? After you create a persona, is, is the, the product owners and the development team, are people constantly referring back to those personas to say, okay, are we still on track? Does this still make sense? Um, and does what we thought we knew about this user still hold true? Is that happening? Or are you creating a deliverable that goes into the void never to be seen again? I'm willing to bet that second thing happens an awful lot. How many of you work in a lean or agile environment where designer UX works two weeks ahead of development? right? The two-week staggered sprint thing. Is that working? Bet you it isn't. In a lot of the organizations uh, I have consulted with, in fact, the majority, I have never seen a single instance where UX and design working two weeks ahead of development has produced anything but surprises. Design is surprised at what developers build. And then when developers get stuff from design back, they're surprised that it's overly complex and difficult to build and not what they plan for at all. Okay, and this bullshit about staggered sprints two weeks apart only continuously surprises everybody all along the way. It builds frustration. Okay, it's flawed. It doesn't, it doesn't work, in my opinion. So what I routinely tell teams is, look, designer UX and development need to be working together every day. If not all day, every day, then at least two or three times a day. Checking each other's work. Hey, here's what I got. What do you think? Does this paint you into any corners? Does this cause any problems? Is this still possible within our deadline? Do you see any, any better ways to do this? And I, by that, I mean both. Design asking development, developing asking design, UX asking development, development asking UX, whatever, collaborating. My point here is that if you have clear evidence that some mandated principle or process or practice or tool isn't working, stop doing it. By all means, stop doing it. I talked to a team toward the end of last year who was adding something like 100 plus items to their backlog every two weeks, okay, at that clip. And I said, look, that's a sure sign that you're not, you're not qualifying all these things that wind up in your sprints. You got way too much on your list to begin with, okay? That's crazy. There's no way you're going to convince me that all that stuff has value. It doesn't. The problem is no one's taking time to think about it, okay? If it's not working, stop doing it. The most useful, powerful, and impactful tool that you have in your arsenal is not a tool at all. It's what's between your ears. Again, we forget this. We, we talk so much about tools and software and processes, methodologies. We forget to think, okay? Your superpower as a superhero is not your physical powers like all these folks you're seeing on the screen um, have. It's, it's your brain. Okay, your superpower is not using tools. It's not running processes. It's your unique ability to solve problems and create opportunities. UXers and designers have an ability that most people around you do not have. That is a superpower, I promise you. But you have to use that before everything else, right? What's between your ears, your brain. The source of that superpower is your brain. It's not your hands. It's never going to be your hands. Okay, it's never going to be what you can do with your hands. So truth number three, think first, simple. Take a step back, think. I believe in that concept so much. Sorry, I wrote a book about it. <laughs> For those of you who may be interested, available at givegoodux.com. Some of you have probably experienced some version of this, and that is putting the cart before the horse. And you've probably seen your stakeholders do this or product owners do this. And that's simply because as humans confronted with a problem, it's really easy for us 
to imagine a solution. If I tell you an issue I have right now, okay, if I talk to you about a problem I'm having, your brain will automatically think of two or three possible solutions. It's how we're wired. Okay, it sort of happens without our permission in a way. That solution, however, is almost always going to be wrong. Why is it wrong? Because we haven't asked any questions yet, or at least not the right ones. This is a gentleman by the name of Sakichi Toyota. He's one of my favorite humans in the history of ever. And the reason for that is he came up with something called the five whys, which some of you may have heard of. This is a process for getting to the truth of the matter, for looking past symptoms and finding the root cause. Here's how this works, okay, in practice. We have a situation where, okay, this new release disabled a feature for customers. And you ask why, why did that happen? And the answer is because the third-party module used wasn't compatible with all browsers. Why wasn't it compatible with all browsers? This is the second why. Because it was implemented the wrong way. Why was it implemented the wrong way? Because the developer who specified it didn't know how to customize the code properly. Why didn't he know how to do that? Because he was never trained. Why wasn't he trained? Because training is not reimbursable. He had to pay for it out of his own pocket, which meant that he probably wasn't going to do it. This is the problem. Now, you may look at this and feel like, well, that's out of my purview as a UXer. It is not. It's not. I cannot count how many difficult problems I've helped organizations solve that had nothing to do with the product itself. Okay, It had to do with communication. It had to do with some process or mandate or protocol the company was following that essentially kept people getting in their own way. It is difficult to do your job well in the face of things like this if you can't get to what the hell is causing the problem in the first place. What will happen is you'll spin your wheels, you keep trying things, and the problem isn't changing, right? There's still defects in the build. UX is still poor every release. And you go, why does this happen? Very rarely, in my opinion, is bad UX in a product the result of designers not being able to do their job well, right? Or UXers not having enough skill or enough talent, or even developers not having the skill or talent or ability. It's not about anyone's ability to do a great job. It's about all the dysfunction that is preventing them from doing a good job, all right? And again, as, a, as an industry, we don't talk about this enough, or nor do we talk about how to deal with it. Truth number four, the right solutions are impossible without the right questions. You have got to get to what the cause really is. And chances are, it's not what you think. Inside organizations, here's how, here's how you get to some of this. UX issues are the result of intent. Jared Spool once said that design is the rendering of intent. I love that phrase. Uh, I think it's great. Jared and I don't always agree on everything, but I think that's brilliant. And I think UX is the same way. What winds up in a product is all about intent. Okay, it's why are we doing this? What outcome do we want? What outcome do we need? Who benefits from that? How do they benefit from that? Should we innovate? Should we make over? Which makes more sense? All right, is that our intention? Uh, do it fast or do it right? Which matters more? And sometimes both of those things are equally valid approaches, believe it or not. Is that their intention? Is the customer's intention? Is it the user's intention? Is it the company's intention? Which matters more, All right? Who wins from customers to users to stakeholders, to clients, to users and customers, whoever, like whose opinion and intention matters most. It's a balancing act. And in some cases, there's no small degree of opposition at play here. Different intent results inside companies from different roles. If you're an executive manager, okay, from, from the CEO all the way down to product owners, product managers, VP of product, whoever, your intent is to make or save this organization money. That is your sole organizing principle. It's what you're there to do. If you're on the technical team, product team, you're leveraging technology resources. You're concerned with, okay, what is this thing? If you're a designer, UXer, we're talking about how do we guide the user's journey? How do we provide value to them? How do we give them visual cues that allow them to walk through it and work through it and use it? If you're a developer, you're concerned with producing robust, error-free code. If you're a project manager, your sole intent is to bring this project in on time and on budget, and you do not care about anything else. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Five groups of people with very different intents by necessity, by necessity of their job. This is what they're paid to do. 
you can see how some of those things don't necessarily align with other things. Okay, this is natural. But again, we don't talk about it very much. Alignment of that intent is what dictates UX maturity in an organization. Of all the companies I work for, there are lots of, of theories, okay, on UX maturity. There's all these levels. I've seen all these models. For my money, there's three stages, okay? Your, your mileage may vary, but for me, there's three stages. A company who is in the operational phase of UX maturity, the majority of their time is spent solving functional problems, development problems. They're putting out fires, okay? There's no time to do anything right because it, there are just too many things that are wrong. Okay, and it's all about get this done. <laughs> the, the overarching question every day is how do we get this done so we can get to all these other things that we haven't touched yet. Next step up is tactical, which means the majority of our time is spent solving user or business problems. Okay, we're getting better. We're thinking about what matters to users. We're thinking about what matters to the business, but we're still spending a hell of a lot of time putting out fires. And the holy grail, which never happens, by the way, is strategic UX maturity, which is the majority of time is spent determining what the right problems to solve are in the first place. It's taking a step back and saying, okay, what's actually worth doing here? I am here to tell you that the, the large majority of organizations are not at this strategic level, no matter what they say publicly, they're not. Okay. I've been inside those, those companies. I've been inside their walls. Companies, you know, um, it's not happening. Okay. Everyone's stuck at the, at the tactical phase, just about. So solving a UX issue of any kind starts with two key questions. And the first is how far out of alignment are our intentions? Remember I told you that on the first day of an engagement with a client, I want department heads from every single department, even if the client says to me, well, they're not really involved in this. Eh, I don't care. I want them in here because they have intent. And their intent, if we don't know what it is, may very likely show up later, okay, two weeks from launch. And they'll say, well, I promised a client that we were going to, or our sales folks have been telling people that it's going to do this, 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 and this. What do you mean? It doesn't do that. Okay. You need to know this up front. How far out of alignment are everybody's intentions here collectively? And number two, does the work that we do, the processes we follow, get us what we intend? Back to this. Okay. I answer those questions by drawing pictures. I draw and I ask questions. And I map it out for them so everybody can see exactly what is happening in terms of reality, right? Let's get out of our own heads and let's figure out what is real, what is actually occurring where the rubber hits the road. I want to hear everybody's complaints um, and, and, you know, refuting. I've, I've had plenty of situations where someone has said, well, that's not how that happens. And I give them the marker. I say, okay, show me how it happens. And they start diagramming it out. And someone else goes, well, yeah, but that's not true either. because this happens and this happens and this happens. And I let them fight this out. I want everybody to see just how much craziness is going on here. Okay. It's really, really important. Truth number five, you must uncover intent. And speaking of intent, I'm going to tell you a little story. Anyone ever heard of this, what's called the sword of Damocles? You may have heard it. You may not know the story. Here's the story. Damocles was uh, a guy who and I'm, I'm struggling here to remember the king's name. He was, he was having an audience with the king, and he wanted a position of power uh, within the king's circle. So he's sitting with the king at dinner, and he's essentially going out of his way, bending over backwards to over compliment the king, or at least he thinks that's what he's doing. And he's telling the king, you know, you must, you have it so wonderfully, like how incredible is this? You have people who serve your every whim, you have all this food and drink whenever you want it. You get to do whatever you want. You get to live in this huge palace. Like essentially he's saying like, your life is so amazing. Look how awesome you are. And as he's doing this, the king is getting more and more and more angry. So he has one of his soldiers, as an aside to one of his soldiers, he has one of his soldiers rig a sword above the guy's head while he's, while he's too, too busy talking. He has a guy rig a sword above the guy's head tied by a horse hair. So the king sits, lets the guy finish, you know, he's telling him, you know, how easy his life is. And the king looks at him and says, look up. The guy looks up and he sees the sword pointed at his head. And the king says to him, this is what it's like to be king. Why do I tell you that story? 90% of the stubborn opposition you're going to encounter from business folks, from product owners, from product managers, from project managers, from developers, 
almost all of it comes from fear. I promise you that. I've been doing this long enough um, to know that that is the truth. If your proposed solution doesn't address that fear, no one will give a shit how great the UX could be. It doesn't matter. Because the people who stake their reputations on this thing, they're getting their asses kicked one way or another, okay? There's pressure, pressure to perform, pressure to hit KPIs, pressure to hit sales numbers, um, pressure to keep customers from leaving who have been complaining about not having a certain feature for the last eight months and a company has been really slow to get it done. So nobody is hearing all that stuff. They're too busy being afraid. <laughs> they care a lot more about all that stuff than about great UX. Designers and UXers, when they pitch and propose their ideas, talk a lot about great UX and great design, and nobody cares. Those non-design and non-UX people, the thing they care about is what does that get us? How does that help us? Okay, I understand you believe in all this. I understand you've got all this research and you've got this big research report that cites you know, all the studies that you've done. Great, what does it get us? No one wants to hear the details. They want to know how does this alleviate the thing that is causing me to go home every night and not sleep because I can't stop thinking about it and I'm worried I'm going to be fired if we don't hit these numbers. Okay, I'm exaggerating, of course, but I'm trying to, to paint a picture for you. So what do they care about? In general, it's a long list, but in general, it's three things. It's the volume of work we're talking about. How much is this? Okay, what they want to know when you're pitching some proposed plan of action, how much is it? What painful problem? Is this work going to solve? And it has to be something that they already care about, okay? Because if it isn't, you will spend hours and weeks and possibly months trying to pitch people on a solution that they're just not interested in. And finally, they want to gain some sense of security that this can actually be solved. If we do all this work, okay, if I give you that time and that budget um, to go run with this, and I do let you talk to users, even though it scares me because I don't really want to hear what our users and customers have to say because I'm worried they're going to tell me things I don't want to hear, what will happen? Okay. What's going to happen? Can you promise me that, that there'll be some benefit out of this? These are the things you have to speak to. Moral of the story is that fear and self-preservation trumps best practice all day, every day. So you must speak to it whenever you're talking about the work you do. Stakeholders often say things like this. I don't want to hear excuses. We need to get this done in two weeks, period. Remember what I said up front about the urgent trumping the important? You say, well, we need four weeks to do that. And they go, two weeks, get it done. Here's how you respond to that. What are you afraid is going to happen if we don't get this right? Because that's really what's being said, okay? You have to listen behind what's actually, what the, behind the words, and you have to listen for intent. The intent here, when someone says, we need to get this done in two weeks, and they don't want to hear logic, okay? That's fear. That's people operating on fear. When there is no real basis for a deadline, and nobody knows why a date is at a certain date, it's because they're afraid of something happening. You need to find out what that thing is. And sometimes it's, a, it's an irrational fear. So by asking this question, what are you afraid is going to happen if we don't get this right? That person may come to the realization that, well, I guess nothing, actually. <laughs> I'm serious. I've, I've had conversations with people where when I asked that question, they went, I, I, I guess nothing. So why is this date have to be this date? Can it be moved a week? Yeah, probably. Okay, changes the complexion of the conversation. Here's another one. We got to fix all these things, ASAP, no exceptions, right? When you get a laundry list of items, things that have to be addressed, and you say, which of these are most important? What's the answer? The answer is always all of them. <laughs> okay, you're asking for prioritization, and they're like, mm, no, all of it, sorry. That's fear as well. So the way you respond to that is how bad is each problem? And how often does each one occur? You have to take it upon yourself to prioritize those things by these two metrics, okay? And say to that person, all right, we're going to tackle the worst things that happen a lot first. Everything else waits because if we don't solve these problems, it doesn't matter if we solve the rest, okay? We're going to be underwater. We're going to be stuck unless we solve these things. So if no one else is going to prioritize that list, you do it. And this is how. You need to have UI design options ready for review by next Wednesday. Again, arbitrary deadline. What you say is, what do you need to know or understand by then to be confident that we're making progress? Whenever somebody tells you what deliverable you have to have ready by a certain time, 
and you're thinking in your head like, okay, that's stupid. It makes no sense. Or we're not even there yet. The only way you're going to win that argument is by asking this question. Again, it's solution jumping. It's saying, well, I need UI options. The reality is they probably don't need UI options. They need some clarity as to what's happening. What do you need to know? What do you need to understand by next Wednesday to feel good about the progress we're making? What would make you feel good about that? Force them to answer that question. Okay, so you answer questions with questions. I hope you're seeing the trend here. UX truth number six, you have to look and listen for fear and make sure you speak to it. In many situations, what I hear from a client when they first engage me is, we need to completely redesign this system. I've heard this more times than I can count over my time uh, doing this, which again, is like far too long. It's like three decades. What I do in response is politely ignore that statement. Seriously. And I sort of push it to the side. And what I do instead is I ask, why? And I ask it at least five times. Why do you need to resign this? Okay. What led you to the point where you said, this whole thing has to be redesigned? What happened? What event took place? Okay. What I'm trying to get to is what caused this panic, what the real issue is, right? What the motivation is, what the intent is, what it is they actually think they're solving by redesigning an entire system, which in most cases is un unnecessary. And I'm going to tell you a little story that illustrates that. I'm going to make it as short as I possibly can. I had a client uh, who was doing a business-to-business self-serve uh, portal, web portal, website, basically, private login. And it's for companies. It's for corporate compliance. So this is a very complex, convoluted product that has to be custom configured for every kind of business to make sure that they are in compliance with US laws. So it's a suite of automated services, okay? Big ticket items. For years, they had been saying, we want to port this online and we want to turn it into e-commerce so that clients can self-serve. Clients have been telling us for 15 years that they want to do this themselves. So we're finally ready to do it. And they've been clamoring for this. So we built it, we did it, and it's not going well. It's not selling, people aren't, aren't buying. It's, so I'm hearing all these convoluted things about how the system is bad, it's dated, it's confusing, it needs to be redesigned, blah, 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 whatever. And I say, all right, time out. Show it to me. So they show it to me. They're walking me through it. And we get to the checkout part. So basically, you spend 45 minutes of your life custom configuring all these solutions. You choose a package, and then you choose all these options. You go through all these steps. All right, literally, it takes about 40 minutes to get everything together. And then you get to checkout, and two things happen. The title of, of the package you bought is nowhere to be found. All the giant list of customizations that you just made, all those choices you just spent 40 minutes making are also nowhere to be found. Yet you are faced with a thing that says, you know, enter PO number and confirm your contract, which is a binding contract in one single step. And I stopped and I said, what happens at this point? And they said, well, people usually bail out. And I said, well, how many people bail out at this point? They're like, well, it's something like 74% of people. <laughs> okay. All right. So time out. So they walk me through the rest of the checkout process, right? You, you're, this is a big ticket item, five figures, and you don't know what the hell you're buying because there's no summary. So I, I forced them to walk me through the rest of the e-commerce process. And what's happened here is that the development team has taken it upon itself to reinvent what checkout looks like and how it works. This checkout process looked nothing like every checkout process you have ever seen in your life. It was so convoluted and so backwards and so fear-inducing on just about every level that I just called a timeout. And I said, look, I know you called me in here to do a complete overhaul, complete redesign. This is your problem right here. So my recommendation is you spend three days fixing this, okay? I'll work with you for three days. We'll fix this into a better, more typical, conventional checkout process, and let's live with it for three months, okay? And see what happens. They're looking at me like I am nuts because I think part of the thinking is like, well, like I was gonna be there for six months. They're like, so you don't want the money? Like, I don't understand. I couldn't in good conscience proceed with a redesign. It was unnecessary. I said, just fix this, spend a couple of days fixing this. Let's live with it for three months. Call me back, let me know what happens. Three months later, on the nose, 
guy that brought me in calls me. He goes, are you sitting down? I said, as a matter of fact, I am. He says, our conversions went up 200%. Okay. 200% people finishing the checkout process, purchasing the product, executing the contract. That's because what actually needed to happen is that the team needed to stop reinventing a wheel. All right. This is a process that was already in place. They just screwed up one piece of the process. The actual design of all those screens that came before, could they be improved? Yeah. Was that really the problem? No. If I hadn't insisted on, on probing deeper, if I had just taken them at their word that like this is what needs to happen, we would have never got to that point. Okay, that client became a retainer-based client where they pay me every month. They've been my client for eight years. You can't discount the value of this. So truth number seven is you have to ignore the ask sometimes. Ignore what's being asked of you in order to get to the need, in order to get to what really needs to happen, in order to get to what people actually need to occur. Remember the value loop on the business side? What do they need? In this case, they needed more people to buy the damn thing. Everything else is a distant second. One last thing before I stop talking and answer questions. A lot of us are afraid to ask questions. Okay, it's human nature. We're afraid of looking dumb. We're afraid of being laughed at. Um, any number of things. Okay, but in most cases, everyone else in the room has the same question. I cannot tell you how many times I've been in a room with a product team as a consultant I sort of automatically uh, am allowed a certain amount of disrespect in a way, because I can ask questions that, that an in-house team can't, right? I can say hard things that, that they're sort of afraid to say. But inevitably, when we take a break, okay, so I'll, I'll, there'll be executives in the room and I'll tell them some hard truths about what I see, things that answers they don't want to hear, um, questions they don't want to be asked. And when we take a break, there's a beeline of people. There's like six, eight, 10 people who are like, I am so glad you said that. We've been, we've been talking about this for months. It's like, all right, if you are sitting there in a room and you're thinking to yourself like, this is ugh, not right. I, I don't know what we're doing here. This doesn't make any sense to me. And you have the urge to raise your hand. I promise you that there are at least two, three, six people in that room who are thinking the same thing. Guaranteed. Just like you, they're afraid to ask it. Here's the thing, no one is fearless. Okay, there's no such thing. For all the stuff I hear about being courageous and being fearless, and uh, it doesn't exist, okay? You're always gonna feel nervous. I, I, to this day, as confident as I may seem to you, when I'm working with students, when I'm working with clients, when I'm working with teams, there's always part of me that is afraid I'm gonna get it wrong, okay? That, that's just, it's human nature. That never goes away. And if you allow it to, it can stop you from doing anything. So you have to get rid of the idea that you can only act when you are feeling confident, okay? When you're not, when you're not feeling fear, when you're fearless. No one is fearless, I promise you. The mantra here is feel the fear and ask the question anyway, okay? One thing I say all the time about people looking at their careers, for example, and afraid to make a leap or afraid to make a change. Feel the fear, do it anyway, same thing. Okay. If you wait until the moment where you are somehow magically fearless, you will be waiting a very long time. Now, before I let you go, I want to tell you about two other things. The first is if you felt that any of this was valuable, I can promise you there's a heck of a lot more at uh, my UX365 Academy. This is an alternative to what I consider to be all overpriced boot camps. <laughs> okay. To, to give you a quick uh, example, Boot camps are, you know, thirteen to fifteen thousand dollars for I don't know, ten months, twelve months. UX three sixty five is one hundred and sixty eight dollars for twelve months for a year. One hundred sixty eight dollars versus thirteen thousand, fifteen thousand. Now, is it one on one instruction? No, it's self serve all the way. But I think that we cover a lot of the same ground. Where our emphasis is on the practical side of this profession. It's on things that nobody talks about. It's on the day to day reality of doing this work. That all those certification courses, which are really just completion certificates, don't talk about, okay? All the things that keep us stuck in any number of ways, that's the stuff I focus on. So I hope you'll take a moment to check it out at that URL. The second thing is, I would like to give you all an ebook for free, and you can do it by going to this URL. It's called The Way It Is, it's 10 Powerful UX Career Tips, which I learned the hard way, <laughs> like most things in life, okay? Most of the stuff that I know that's valuable, 
I learned from getting my nose broken sometimes more than once. So that is yours if you want it at that URL. And with that, I will simply say thank you for your time and your attention. And I will open it up to questions. Thank you so much for a great talk. And like, I think a lot of you guys behind the screen as well are sit sitting with the same, uh, same feeling as I do, that it's just nice that somebody actually verbalized all the fear and all the struggles and all the doubts that all of us has. So I think it's right. like amazing to hear. And uh, thank you so much for the book as well. I actually have a question and it, it's, it's because like it actually taps a bit into like you're consulting going out, but like, do you have any good recommendations for if you are a designer going into a new organization, you're hired full time, what would your first step be in that position? Well, there's two parts to that. I mean, anytime you're new inside an organization, the first part is you got to give yourself a lot of road and a lot of patience. Everybody expects to be able to hit the ground running. Employers often do this thing where they're like, must hit the ground running. Eh, there's no such thing. It takes six to 12 months for any new employee to really find their feet in terms of the way work moves through this company, in terms of the way people interact with each other, right? Who has power, who has political juice, who gets in the way of things, right? There's all sorts of little nuances of, of how work happens. It takes time to get a handle on that. So the first thing you do, number one, is accept that um, mentally and emotionally, give yourself a break. You're not going to figure it out all, all of it in the first month. It's just not going to happen. But you have to ask questions relentlessly. And, and the questions you're asking is about how work happens. Who initiates something? Where does it go from there? What kind of conversations or meetings take place? When does it get to us? Right? What do we do with it? What's that process look like? And you're asking in a way where you're saying, I just want to get a handle on how things work here. Now, ideally, you should be asking those questions in the interview process. But now that you're there, you're looking for somebody in your immediate inside circle who can sort of be your advocate. Okay. And in general, that's going to be a small circle. So the person who's willing to spend the most time speaking with you, period, that becomes the person you bug. This is your new best friend. <laughs> All right. You want to know everything there is to know, um, just to get a handle on it. And, and the thing you cannot do, it was the kiss of death for a lot of folks in new positions is to that last sort of slide that I showed about being fearless. When they have questions, they feel like, well, I'm, you know, I'm three years into my career, I should know this already. Get rid of that voice. You have to ask the question. If you proceed with something on a guess, you don't ever want to guess when you're new on the job ever, not ever, ever. If you don't know something, you have to ask somebody and you have to disregard the voice that says, they're going to think you, know, you don't know what you're doing. Hmm. But I think that goes for all professionals, right? Yes. Because I've been in so many meetings in big organizations where like sometimes you also just fly on the wall and you can just hear that there's like one is speaking in like here and the other one is speaking here. And then they go out of the meeting being like, they actually think there's consensus. And you're just like, okay, you were discussing like two polls and no, you didn't reach any agreement whatsoever. So I right. think it's just important right. in order that, as you point out, being, being fearless and just like also not being afraid of yeah. like, sounding stupid when you ask the questions. Right. I mean, I do that with clients, okay? I've, I've, I'll ask a question. I'll say, well, can you explain that to me in greater detail? And it's happened many times in our career. Someone will say, well, I just did. Yeah. All right, they're irritated that they have to enlighten me. Yeah. And, and, it's, and there's arrogance that goes with that. They're like, well, you're the expert. Why don't you know everything? And I'll say, I know you explained it, but I didn't understand it. In order for me to help you, I need to understand it. So yeah. I'm asking you to be patient with me and just walk me through it again. Yeah. And I don't care if they're pissed off. You understand? It doesn't matter to me. I mean, my, my job is not to, to make friends necessarily. My job is to help them. I can't do that if I don't know what the hell's going on, right? Yeah. So I'm going to keep asking for clarification until I get it, until I understand it. I don't care what anybody thinks of that. If you want me to help you, you need to tell me. Yeah, I think that's a good point, to be honest. So a lot of people are very heavy about the talk, so... Uh... That goes out to you, Joe. So I think we have a question here. So how to balance business needs and user needs in the UX vision and strategy? You have to find the spots um, where the two things overlap. Okay, that, that value loop I talked about is really important. This is going to sound like sacrilege to a lot of people. I don't ever start with users. I start with business first. My, my research is always business side first because that's where the obstacles are. Okay, the problems that users have are the result of business side mismatches in intent, fear, dysfunction, 
politics, whatever it is, nine times out of 10, the reason users aren't getting what they want is because there's a problem on the business side. So the first thing I need to know is what do these people want? And I also need to know where they're disagreeing, okay? If marketing is disagreeing with sales, is disagreeing with product, you know, or the CEO is overriding everybody because they have a, they saw some product last week and they think everything should work like that. Yeah. I need to know that. I'm going to get nowhere. We're going to spin our wheels for four weeks. We're going to do all this work and none of it's going to matter because the big cheese is going to come in and say, no, I want it this way. Okay, I need to know that stuff up front. So the way you, you balance it is you start with the more difficult side of the equation, which is always going to be the business side. Okay, you get that in line first. You make sure you understand what people want, why they want it, what's at stake. What it, because all those things tell you where people are going to stand up and say, we're not doing that. All right. It, it, it allows you to the, the theme of this talk. It's, it's about getting real. It's about here's the situation. Okay. Here are the confines. Here are the constraints that we have to work inside. If you start from there and then you go to customers and users and say, all right, what satisfies this need that I know now know the business has? What, what's going to calm them down? And at the same time, what things that enable that also provide more value for users. So you don't change everything all at once. You pick your spots and you say, I'm going to do this first so that we get a win. Customers get what they want. Business gets what they want. And everyone goes, wow, that was really good. Okay, what else do we do? <laughs> You're yeah. going to have a much easier time with the next chunk if you get a win right out of the gate. And the only way, in my opinion, you're going to get a win out of the gate is if you start with the business. Yeah. So just one last question, and that actually goes out to that you, you started out by saying that developers and business and engineers and so on, everybody actually wants to like create a good user experience. And I think a lot of us has experience when we go into an organization, especially if they have not had any designers yet, for instance, and then they show you something and they're just like, look at this shiny, beautiful thing. And they love it, right? They're excited. And can you just spread some magic around it? And then like, how do you handle that? Like saying that, you know, we know that of course you did your best, you put in a lot of effort, but, 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 right? Well, and that's what you do. You walk through it. You walk through it and you say, okay, you, get, I'm, you know, I'm really impressed with this part. And you single out something, all right? You find something to talk about to say, I can see why you did this. And then you start to ask questions. You know, is, is there a specific part of this you find that people have trouble with? You're looking for, you're looking for an inroad, an opportunity to say, okay, well, if they're not reacting to that this way, this could be the reason. And now you comment on the design. But you have to set that up in a way that doesn't make people feel like you're calling their baby ugly which is really what it is, okay? You have to be really careful <laughs> about what you say and how you say it. But, but part of that is you always have to start with some sort of positivity, right? I can, I can see, obviously, this came a long way. I think you, you're doing a really good job of A, B, and C. I want you to tell me about what's, what's going sideways here, okay? What isn't working the way that you hoped that it would be? So you take the conversation away from the product, for the time being in those situations. And you talk about what's not happening that you wish was happening. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's, yeah, I'm, I'm completely agreeing. So time is up. We actually like a bit over time as well. So I can see new questions okay. pops up. I think like I could imagine that you would love to answer questions if, if you have, uh, if, if people sent them to you or connect with you on LinkedIn and so on. So please feel free to, to do that, of course. And also yeah. reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, Twitter is where I am most often. Yeah. Okay. But that's that okay. Good still, too. still on Twitter after everything that has happened. I'm staying. I was here first. Okay. I don't care what he does. I'm. I was here first. Okay. I'm not leaving. Good he's not, he's not driving me out of my house. It's not happening. <laughs> good approach. But I think we need to stop now. But again, thank you so much for a very in uh, interesting. You're very talk. welcome. Um, and for those of you behind the screen, like keep an eye on the inbox. We will uh, email you the recording of today's talk and also Joe's slides. And again, if you have any questions regarding Preli or if you could see some sort of uh, some sort of match, then please reach out and then we'll see what uh, we can do. And if you have any names or ideas for talks and so on, let us know as well. And uh, maybe we can make magic happen. So I think uh, I'll just say thank you for now. Thank you for joining and have a great evening, everyone. So bye-bye. Thank you all so much. Bye.